Growing pressure to deny Iran access to one of its largest entry points into the world financial system, that is SWIFT. This would, as my next guest puts it, be like canceling the Mullah's credit card. Joining me now is Jonathan Shanzer. He is vice president of research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thanks so much for joining us. Explain to us what that means. Why would it be like canceling their credit card? How much money runs through SWIFT? What kinds of transactions are cleared there? Sure. Well, SWIFT is basically the lifeblood of the economic uh, system, the, f the, uh, the electronic economic system uh, around the world. Uh, if I want to transfer funds anywhere around the world, I'm usually going to use SWIFT uh, to make sure that that transaction is settled. It's a way of having my bank communicate with your bank to ensure that, for example, uh, money would be debited from my accounts and added to yours. And there are, of course, other uh, companies that do this, but SWIFT is the biggest. It's sort of the Google, if you will, uh, of the uh, global electronic financial system and what members of Congress are talking about now is cutting Iran out of it completely to give a sense of what that would mean for the Iranians uh, in 2010 alone they did 35 billion dollars in business uh, via SWIFT with Europe now extrapolate that out and think about Russia the Far East the Middle East Latin America and you're looking at probably hundreds of billions of dollars that you can deprive of the Iranian yeah. regime I mean, you say it's the electronic bloodstream of the global financial system, but how hard would it be for them just to jump onto another platform? Uh, you know, I mean, I think obviously they'll be able to work with other platforms, but each one of these platforms, I think, has uh, their own vulnerabilities. I mean, so right now you're looking at Congress talking uh, to SWIFT, but there are a number of other uh, companies that are public, for example, uh, others that uh, have to abide by the rules of the EU or the United States. And so each one of them has pressure points where the United States uh, can, can bring that pressure to bear and uh, potentially lock out the Iranians completely. You know, you say that $35 billion, uh, in trade with Europe goes through the system alone and that they almost certainly violate existing sanctions right now on the trades they do on this platform or the clearing that they do on this platform. Why isn't anyone doing anything about that right now? Well, it's unclear, uh, but uh, when we wrote this piece for foreign policy uh, a couple of weeks ago, what we pointed out was is that, first of all, uh, SWIFT is headquartered in Belgium, and so that means that uh, they have to abide by the laws of the European Union. The European Union has gone after the Iranians for their terrorist activity, for their proliferation activity. A number of banks have already been sanctioned, and so it really makes sense that uh, the Europeans would impose this upon SWIFT. But we've also made note that SWIFT should be doing this on its own. If you take a look at SWIFT's bylaws, what they say is that they should not be doing business but, you know, by their own admission with anyone involved in terrorism or proliferation and that they have a right, uh, indeed an obligation, to cut them off. And so yeah. to a certain extent, this is just about corporate transparency. So how big of a deal would it be to shut off this credit card, so to speak? I mean, would we see the Iranian economy go into a collapse or is it not that severe because they've even said that they're already working on a way to trade with Russia outside of this clearinghouse? Well, I think you're going to see a barter system. Uh, in other words, the Iranians have oil and other people want that oil, and so they'll trade that for food or they'll trade it for other, other goods. Uh, and I think we'll continue to see that. I also would expect that no matter what happens, if, if SWIFT imposes this themselves or if the United States or other countries enforce this with SWIFT, there will be exceptions and there will be waivers. So in other words, uh, you know, in, an, in an attempt not to, to create jitters in the oil market, so you may see that So is it not that, that effective SWIFT then? Is it not that big of a deal? Oh, no, it'll still be a big deal, believe me. I mean, you know, the exceptions would be on oil, probably food and, and medicine, if those exceptions are put into place. But in the meantime, if the Iranians wanted to buy anything else through the electronic financial system, they would be shut out completely, basically grinding their, uh, their main economy to a halt. And so it could have a pretty significant, I don't want to overstate this, but I think it could be rather significant. You think this we is have the logical, smartest next step for, for the U.S.? Well, I, you know, there's, there's really not many options left. You know, we've gone That's after true. the Iranians' oil. We've gone after some of their banks. We've gone after their central bank. We've gone after the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. We've really done everything that we can to put sanctions on Iran in an attempt to, to pull them back from this nuclear brink. They continue to move forward, and so I believe that this is probably one of the last cards left to play to show them that we're serious and to try to really impose some pain on them to make them rethink their calculus. If they don't, then we're we're really going to be stuck with some difficult choices, and that's what we're trying to avoid. All right, Jonathan Chanzer, some great information there. We really thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're welcome.